So good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sport Manitoba Coaching's professional development session for National Indigenous History Month. The session is titled Indigenous Experiences in Accessing Sport. My name is Shay Samick, and I'm the coach education coordinator for Sport Manitoba Coaching. Um, super thrilled that you guys can join us tonight. I know that we have some people joining from across Canada. So thanks again for hopping in on this session. Um, so I'm going to be recording tonight's session and it will be recording the Q&A. So please keep yourselves muted until the Q&A portion at the end of the session. There will be about 15 to 20 minutes at the end for the Q&A. Um, our speakers for tonight's session will be Jamie Menzies and Hayden Dupasque. Uh, Jamie Menzies is a policy analyst at the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs, the head volleyball coach from the Canadian Mennonite University, Director and founder of Agusian Volleyball and head volleyball coach for the North American Indigenous Games. Hayden is an Indigenous community sports consultant with the Manitoba Aboriginal Sports and Recreation Council. And with that, I will pass the session on to Jamie and Hayden. Cool. Thanks, Jay. Um, I'm actually going to start us off and then I'll hand off to Kede. And I'm going to share my screen first. <clears throat> Okay, um, I'm hoping that's working for everyone. <clears throat> so like I said, um, I'll start, I'll probably yap at you for about 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to be kind of focusing on some broader, more conceptual ideas and reflections and my colleague Cade will get a little bit more specific. He works for MASRC as well, so he is kind of on the front line of Indigenous sport in Manitoba. So at the end in the Q&A, um, you can kind of ask questions accordingly. So I want to start just with this title. Um, <clears throat> this working title, um, we didn't really know exactly what to entitle it, but I'll just kind of break it down um, so you're clear on what I'm addressing. First of all, Indigenous is the broad term that incorporates First Nations, Inuit, and Métis folks. Um, that said, I am Métis and I have experience coaching, working with, and I have relationships with, and I'm family members with Métis folks and First Nation folks. Um, that said, my experience with Inuit um, communities and athletes is very limited. So my experience and the way that I'm reading the term Indigenous tonight is from a Métis and First Nations lens, but largely Métis. Um, now, this word accessing sport, um, you know, I don't know exactly what the audience was looking for tonight, but um, there can be some very specific and physical ways that we can mean access, like um, geography and funding and transportation and stuff. Um, I am going, like I said, I'm going to kind of be interpreting access pretty broadly. So kind of in a philosophical sense or in like a, um, emotionally and mentally and things like that. Um, yeah, and then sport, I'm also, I don't know the audience again, like I said, so I'm interpreting that broadly as well. We can discuss specifics in the Q&A, such as if you're from an elite context, if you do rec sport, if you do phys ed, if you do individual sports, team sports. Um, but I'm gonna be addressing, when I, when I say sport tonight, I just mean all of those things wrapped into one. Yes, as I figure out my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, so you'll maybe note that Shay did not do a land acknowledgement. I asked her if I could do it instead. Um, to be frank, a lot of land acknowledgements kind of grind my gears, and so I just kind of wanted to do it a certain way. Um, I don't actually believe typically that Indigenous folks should be the people doing land acknowledgements, um, but I am going to do my own tonight for a couple reasons. First of all, to situate myself and kind of start this talk off thoughtfully for my own purposes, but also to provide all of you with maybe an example of what a thoughtful land acknowledgement can look like and you can make it your own um, going forward. So first of all, in a land acknowledgement, we address the where. That's kind of the obvious part. So I will do that. Um, I'm tuning in from Winnipeg and Winnipeg is kind of loosely translated um, from cr the Cree word for muddy waters. We're situated on the forks of two muddy bottom rivers and that's where the name for Winnipeg came from. Um, it's also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Ininu, which are the Ojibwe and the Cree, as well as the Dakota. And it's the homeland of the Métis Nation to which I belong. And so does my friend Kade. 
Um, more specifically, I'm in the neighborhood, the Wolseley neighborhood in Winnipeg, and I think that's notable because um, Wolseley is named after Colonel Wolseley. So when the Manitoba Act was signed in 1870, um, the Canadian government sent Colonel Wolseley and his brigade over to these parts to kind of rid the space of Métis hangers honors and First Nations folks in the area. So that in 1870 was called the Reign of Terror, entitled by Indigenous folks. And so I get to live in that Colonel's namesake. So that's kind of a topic of contention and we're talking about changing the name of Wolseley. Anyway, so that's where I am. And I know you're all tuning in from different places, <clears throat> but for your land acknowledgements in the future, you can kind of discuss things like that. Um, now, who I am or who we are in relation to the land. So um, I mentioned that I'm Métis, uh, more specifically uh, on my mom's side, both of her sides of the family are Métis. Our Cree relatives married into the Bruno family and they originated in what we now call St. Boniface. The Ojibwe side of my family married into the Vandell family and they lived in what we now refer to as St. Patel um, and later kind of moved further west as um, colonial powers became stronger in this area and my family members kind of established we're part of a group that established saint rose du lac so if you know rural manitoba that's where my family kind of settled down my grandparents moved to dauphin from there and that's where i was born so that's my metis family's kind of history on these lands um, now what are we doing that's kind of a big question but i'm just going to kind of cut it off at you know i think we're all here today um, because we are trying to create spaces for play and facilitate play in the best way that we can. So I appreciate you're all here tonight and I believe that we're all kind of putting trying to do put our best feet forward. <clears throat> now when are we doing it? So I want to expand a bit more on that. Um, the context of when in this land acknowledgement, June happens to be Indigenous Peoples History Month, as Shay mentioned, but it is also um, Pride Month or 2S LGBTQAI plus um, History Month and Commemoration Month and everything like that. So I think that's also an important context to our conversation tonight. Um, let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> I guess the when continued these these months, Indigenous Peoples Month and Pride Month, um, what should we do with that? You know, like it, there's some parties and there's some festivities, but what can we do with that information? So on one hand, I think there's space to celebrate, um, you know, celebrate diversity, celebrate culture, celebrate expression, um, celebrate people that have overcome challenges and who continue to do so, celebrate whatever you think is relevant under those two banners. Um, commemorate. I think that's a really important part of these two, the month of June. Um, we want to commemorate people who have sacrificed before us, people who have laid the foundations so that Indigenous folks and queer folks can be here and thriving. Um, those who have succeeded against the odds, let's commemorate the traumatic and harmful histories um, that have happened on these lands. Um, let's commemorate loved ones that we have or friends and family that we have who have been impacted by either being Indigenous or queer or, you know, e e under either of those banners. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> I think that this month it's important to contemplate. And so I want to talk a little bit more about this. Um, yeah, I think it's important. Sorry. In this contemplative um, context, I think it's important for us to seek learning opportunities, both about Indigenous experiences, but also about queer experiences, specifically two-spirited experiences in the Indigenous context. Um, I want to acknowledge all of you are here today, and you know you are seeking this learning opportunity, so I appreciate that. Um, but then I think part of contemplation, it's also important to question and even challenge norms. I say norms in quotations because norms to some people aren't norms to everyone. Um, question attitudes and question systems. So we're going to live there for a minute in my final, in the final piece of my extensive land acknowledgement. We're going to live in this questioning norms, questioning attitudes, and questioning system space. So what do I mean by that? Um, to put it frankly, uh, we live in a colonial state. So the norms that we've come to know as norms are 
colonial norms. The attitudes that exist that impact Indigenous folks and Two-Spirit folks and LGBTQ plus folks are colonial attitudes. The systems that Indigenous and queer folks have to live in are um, colonial systems. Um, you know, and colonization is not just simply a physical displacement of Indigenous people. It certainly is physical, but it was also <clears throat> the forced economic, political, ideological, cultural, spiritual, all of these things. It was the occupation and exploitation and control of people in all of those ways. Um, so, you know, colonization was a physical displacement at one time, but today it is ongoing and it continues to live through these norms, attitudes, and systems. So with these systems kind of came a whole new, oh, what am I, what, what should I say? So um, these systems and attitudes aren't indigenous to this land, um, but also were actively designed to destroy indigenous peoples. Um, a lot of you probably know that already, um, but for indigenous folks, that's at the forefront of indigenous experiences and minds every day. Um, you know, these sets of systems not only destroyed the people, Indigenous people, but also their values and ways of being. So to name a few systems, norms, um, and we're, we're going to revisit these a little later, but, you know, the patriarchy is a colonial system, capitalism, heteronormity, normativity, um, the adversarial justice system, Christianity, uh, state control and policing, racism, or specifically racial supremacy of white, white, socialized white folks. Um, and then also just another example is the human domination over the natural world. All of those things are things that we're used to and are normal now, um, but are not indigenous values and were designed to destroy indigenous people and their values. Um, they kind of resulted in things like residential schools, 60s scoop, Indian Act policies, state violence, things like this. Um, so I've kind of said already, these things set Indigenous people up for failure, but they also, on the contrary, set up other demographics for success. So more on that later, we're going to come back to this, <laughs> but for now, I just want to conclude my land acknowledgement. Um, I know that was hefty, but I think that all of that context is important to what we're about to discuss tonight. So probably all, definitely those that know me are probably sitting there thinking like, okay, Jamie, get to the point. What does this have to do with youth in sport? Um, well, <clears throat> so not everyone's always aware of the systems and norms that are either lifting them up, raising them up or tearing them down and harming them. Um, and certainly sport is not immune to these pressures, to these systems, to these norms sport is impacted by colonial systems and colonial attitudes. Um, and in fact, I would go so far to say that um, sport can act as an instrument of colonialism. And I would say that most often, unless intentionally um, designed otherwise, it by default is an instrument of colonialism. So that's why I'm glad that you're all here tonight because you know we're gonna talk about um, what we can do to impact that. Um, and just to kind of paint this picture a little more clear, um, ways that sport, just examples of ways that sport acts as an instrument of colonialism without us maybe even noticing it. Um, it's more accessible to certain demographics than others. And that's often kind of written off as a, well, this person can afford it and this person can't, or, well, this person lives closer, this person doesn't excuse me, um, but the systems were designed that way. Another example, sport upholds hierarchies. So, you know, in a sports space, often, not always, but in a lot of sports and rec, there's a coach or kind of a dictator at the top of the hierarchy. And then maybe assistant coaches are slightly lower, have less authority. Um, athletes have less, maybe the more talented athletes have a bit more and the less talented athletes have a bit less, but there's this hierarchical view of a sport system. Um, whereas an indigenous worldview is more cyclic, colonial worldview is up down. Um, another example are the environmental impacts of sport, um, rewards for individual success, upholding gender binaries, boys, girls, we know that story. Um, 
you know, even not playing national anthems at all sporting events or how we wear nations flags, but not indigenous nations flags, you know, things like that. So these are just some examples I could go on and on and on, but sport does act as an instrument of colonization, um, colonialism, and not surprisingly that impacts the participants. Um, but if done thoughtfully, um, it, sport, as everyone here also knows, can be life-giving and life-saving. And it's easier for sport to be that for the demographics that colonialism serves. It's harder for sport to be life-giving and life-saving for the demographics that colonialism is meant to harm. So in order for sport to be life-giving for youth that are socialized as Indigenous, the people creating the sport spaces um, have to understand and deconstruct the impacts of colonialism. So that's where all of us come in. Um, and I should explain, I kind of use this term, youth that are socialized as Indigenous. Um, I, you know, some Indigenous youth appear and present as Indigenous or are raised on reserve or have, you know, come in contact with child welfare based on their Indigeneity, things like this, they've been socialized as, as Indigenous. Other Indigenous youth um, have been socialized in a way where they are white passing. And so the impacts between these two populations may be different. So I'm just um, giving a little disclaimer about the use of that term, socialized as Indigenous. <clears throat> Anyway, I'll give a little example here. Um, yeah, so Shay mentioned that I run a, a Guchin volleyball. Um, it's a program uh, that I direct for um, Indigenous girls and two-spirit athletes, but also coaches. And it was kind of born out of a few different ideas of mine. But one of the things is when I was working for the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit folks, um, we came across a lot of stories of suicide or even suicide ideation or depressive states that led to suicide attempts or self-harm. And so in our research stages, um, we, we had to tie that to, well, what does that have to do with being Indigenous? You know, suicide unfortunately happens across um, cultures, ethnicities, races. but. Um, you know, we found, we did all we also found, and this research is out there that the suicide rates um, in First Nations and Inuit youth are actually the highest in the world. Um, and on like a personal note, I have friends who live on reserves who say to me, you know, every day that they wake up and see that their neighbor actually got out of bed or their friend showed up at work or you know, people have these experiences where suicide is so prevalent in their nations that they celebrate every day they see some of their friends and family just show up to work in school. So this is a very real um, situation. So anyway, I was doing research with the inquiry and also found that sport specifically is a called a primary protective activity. That means that physical activity and sport are a protective factor against suicide, one of the top, and it's just accepted as that. So anyway, that is kind of the main reason why I started a Guchin is because I realized, well, you know, I am Indigenous, I can coach, um, why don't I create a space if it, that can hopefully contribute to, you know, decreasing suicide rates. Um, but that wasn't, it wasn't as easy as that because I had to do, I knew I had to do it in the right way um that wasn't perpetuating harm and perpetuating colonial attitudes um yeah so that's just kind of my little aside okay so i've been saying to you let's decolonize sport and rec but how do we do that now <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to do this i'm just going to kind of touch on a few my friend kate is also going to touch on a few um, again, I will stress, seek le learning opportunities with an open mind. Um, you're doing that tonight, but I also just want to stress and kind of let you know what you're doing. You are, tonight you are learning from Indigenous folks who have consented to teaching you. Um, there's a lot of other types of learning that's not healthy or welcome. For example, um, 
asking questions to Indigenous folks that aren't consenting to teaching. Um, I'll also differentiate learning from Indigenous folks with learning about Indigenous folks. You know, we all remember the history books that we had in high school that were written by white folks about Indigenous people. Um, that is learning about Indigenous people and colonization, but it's not learning from um, Indigenous folks about colonization. So I just want to differentiate that. But tonight you are satisfying what I'm suggesting with this number one step. So congratulations to you, we're partway there. Um, okay, so number two, kind of two ideas here. So diversify and indigenize. I'm gonna start with diversify. Um, now, I, I always struggle with my wording here because I am not gonna say what I'm about to say in order to villainize the men in the space, the white presenting men in the space that are doing very good work. Um, I'm not trying to um, attack individual men, but I am trying to decolonize the patriarchy at large. So diversifying, adding women to your coaching teams, adding queer folks to your coaching teams, adding two-spirit folks to your coaching teams, or just to your support systems or to your rosters, that is decolonizing the space, that is anti-patriarchal and that is anti-heteronormative. Um, so both of those things are diversifying while also decolonizing, um, including people of color, including other equity deserving groups, um, disabled bodied athletes, coaches, things like that. So that is how we diversify in a way that also decolonizes spaces for youth and people. Um, indigenizing, so that I'm mostly going to let Kat A talk about that. Um, how to you know incorporate indigenous values and things into your space but i'm going to just give one example and i'm going to refer back to my guchin volleyball club is just our um, indigenous mentorship model so um because i've been i can blend in and feel comfortable in indigenous spaces and um settler spaces i'm going to wear my uh, settler cap for a minute. So I am white presenting, I'm white passing, um, but my Guchin mentorship model, to start, I brought on um, young indigenous women and two spirit folks, and I mentored them for a while. But I wasn't telling them, you know, everything to, I was not, I was trying not to teach it, treat it like a dictatorship, but it was, it, there was a reciprocal relationship. I was learning from them and their experiences, and they were learning from me and my experiences. And so I started with a small group of mentees. But then as they got more comfortable and they got more, more comfortable, you know, in the more recent years, they are now the head coaches that are mentoring younger Indigenous coaches. So initially the only option i had was to be kind of the head coach um and to be kind of a cooperative model but now i'm i've taken a full step back i'm not coaching any of the aguchin teams the former mentees are now the head coaches and we bring in new um mentees and it's just kind of this cycle of of indigenizing the space with indigenous coaches and so that's just one example that's um is more complex than i'm making it sound but um, that is something that everyone in this space could try, um, and maybe we can have more discussion about that in Q&A if, if that kind of piques anyone's interest. That's just one example. Okay, and then so finally, um, how can I decolonize sport and rec spaces? Number three, um, self-reflection, honesty, and vulnerability. And these all maybe sound like fuddy-duddy words, but I'm going to elaborate on them so they don't sound so fuddy-duddy and they're a bit more applicable. So <clears throat> we can all benefit from this in just like everyday life, but um, I want, and, and we as indigenous coaches can also benefit from this stuff, but I want to put more of the onus on for this on non-indigenous facilitators and coaches or people who were not socialized as indigenous at least, um, because people who weren't socialized as indigenous cannot possibly profoundly know what it is to exist in the world or in sports spaces as a person who is socialized as Indigenous. But some self-reflection and some honesty is a good start. Um, so what I'm suggesting you do is, um, first of all, this piece of self-reflection. Um, 
another way of putting it is taking stock of your positionality, your position in the world. Um, I'll give you an example, and I'm going to use me as an example because I think it's beneficial for me to do this also. So on one hand, I am straight passing. People would not guess that I'm queer necessarily just by looking at me. I am not disabled. I have a white father who comes with intergenerational wealth passed because his ancestors were given cheap land in southern Manitoba. Uh, I'm white passing. I have a reliable income that kind of stemmed from this intergenerational wealth and being able to access education. On the other hand, um, I am a woman, so there is, um, you know, not quite as much privilege there. Um, and I am, in fact, Indigenous. So with that does come some intergenerational trauma of my ancestors and also um, experience of my mother and my grandmother and my grandfather and what has come with that and my connection to Indigenous communities. So anyway, that's kind of me taking stock of my positionality. Um, I have a lot of privilege going for me, as you can hear. Um, and then there are, and, and I guess the difference is knowing the spaces where my voice is welcome and where I should be a teacher and knowing the spaces where I should listen and learn. So for example, um, I'm comfortable speaking as an Indigenous person, as I am tonight, um, but I also know in certain cases when my experience was a privileged one and I should stop and listen to other people that have had um, different experiences more heavily impacted by colonialism. So that's me taking stock. And that's what I'm suggesting everyone in this space does at some point, self-reflect. <clears throat> now, as far as honesty and vulnerability, um, I think that it's really important to be open about your positionality. You know, there's kind of this like, an example that actually just popped my mind, there's kind of this like politeness, for example, about like not talking about people's salaries, you know, don't ask someone what they what their income is, or don't tell people what your income is. Um, but that is like a dishonest um, thing, and actually just a way to like stifle colonial privilege and impacts in people's lives. So that's just like one example. But I think that being honest and vulnerable with your self reflection is important, whether you fall entirely in the category of privilege your whole life, or not um, being honest with your reflections and your positionality with your athletes with decision makers with your family with your friends with yourself. Um, I think is very important, and why do I think that's important. <clears throat> Sorry i'm trying to switch a slide here. yeah so the impacts of being honest and vulnerable with your reflections um, first of all. It shows that you are learning, that you're open to learning, and it also makes space for others to do the same. People in your peer group will then realize how they are privileged or where they they aren't and may do the same. Um, it also, if you're a coach, it, ma it makes space for the youth in your, on your field, in your gym, um, to either do the same or if they're indigenous, for example, they can become the teachers, they can become the, the holders of knowledge. Now they can, you know, fill in the gaps in the way in the spaces that you don't know about. Um, so this kind of empowers indigenous youth, they see that you're acknowledging, I have privilege in these ways, and I don't understand all of these things. And indigenous youth could step up and become the teachers. And that kind of di disrupts the hierarchy and empowers them to have a voice on those topics. But also it allows Indigenous youth to feel seen and to feel understood. If non-Indigenous people are acknowledging their privilege and acknowledging how colonialism has privileged them, then there's like this, then your athletes are feeling understood and that their situation and their experiences are understood and acknowledged as true. <clears throat> Another impact of, you know, sharing your positionality is that it's reciprocal. Um, now, reciprocity or like mutual sharing um, is a pillar of Indigenous values. Um, and, you know, we as coaches, we expect vulnerability from our athletes um, all the time. Uh, every day, really, they show up in a gym, they show up for, and they, they have to be vulnerable to try and try sports. And this is us being vulnerable in return. 
um, this is as a side, this is something I'm working on and I'm not always great at. It's much more comfortable to be a coach that is in control at all times, but vulnerability is something that I'm working on in order to kind of have that reciprocal relationship with my athletes. And then finally, a resulting impact of this is kind of maybe the obvious one, but it acknowledging your privilege and acknowledging that that stems from colonialism and the harms caused to Indigenous folks is challenging colonial mindsets and it challenges um, colonial power structures and is a, and thus is a step towards decolonizing sport in general. If all coaches did this, if all spaces were you know considering these things, um, it could quell the impact on Indigenous youth in sports spaces. So I did warn you that I was going to be a little more conceptual and a little less like specific, um, but that's kind of all I'm going to talk about for now. I want to hand it over to Kade and then I'm happy to have chats again in the Q&A. All yours, Kate. Do you still have the slides up, Jamie or Shay? Yeah, do you want me to click through them for you or put them up? Sure, let's do that. Yeah, I'll try to, I, I won't take too much time because um, a lot of it is going to be referenced that they can read on their own. Okay, sure. I'm going to start by saying, uh, yeah, just Marcy Miigwech, thank you to, to Jamie. I, I haven't really had the opportunity until tonight, I think, to actually work and speak directly with Jamie. So I think we've known each other for a long, long time and, and worked kind of with each other together on, <laughs> and just in the Indigenous sports community. So it, it's it's kind of an honor and a privilege. And I'm, I'm always learning and love to hear Jamie speak. So that's why I wanted to, Jamie to go before me. Thanks. I'll pull All up right. the slideshow now. Here we go. So just a quick introduction. So Tanchi Kiawa, Kadain Dijini Kashun. So I basically just said, good evening. Uh, how, how are you all doing? Uh, my name is Kadain. So learning a little bit of my language. Uh, obviously, Indigenous, a big part of uh, is the language revitalization. And uh, Michif specifically is, I think, very endangered right now. So trying to uh, learn and connect with my, my native language a little bit and uh, in my culture. So an introduction is what I have so far. We're gonna go from there. So yeah, I, I won't take take too much time. I think it's important to, again, acknowledge where we are. So so I was born and raised, uh, I'm a member of Red River Métis Nation. Um, and I was born and raised in Winnipeg here in Treaty One territory. And uh, I, I live in the Elmwood area. So I won't take too much time to talk about that. What I do for work is uh, like, like uh, Shay mentioned, I'm an indigenous community sports consultant with the Manitoba Aboriginal Sports and Recreation Council. We are the, I'll throw another acronym at you, we are the PTASB. So we're the, the Indigenous Sport Body, Provincial Terrestrial uh, Indigenous Sport Body in Manitoba. So those of you that are, are not from Manitoba, please connect if you haven't already with your local or ter uh, provincial or territorial Indigenous Sport Body. Um, I'm sure they'll have lots of resources for you as well. One thing that I'll mention off the top, and I'm sure we'll mention it again later, is leave you with the Aboriginal coaching module. Much more detail. It's a workshop style. You're going to learn a lot. Even if you don't currently coach Indigenous people, you, you probably do, but maybe you're not aware of it. Like we talked about self-identifying, maybe not visible. Uh, you will eventually, and you probably have. So really, really good for, for coaches, leaders educators, anybody really to learn a little bit about that, a little more cultural and, and holistic point of view. All right, let's start the slide. There we go. So I try to think of, I'm more of a talker, a communicator, um, but to think of one picture, uh, my job is to travel across uh, the, the, the province and visit different communities, indigenous communities, 
uh, speak with the stakeholders and the community members and leaders. And this kind of comes to mind. I'm sure when we saw this, we all had our own sort of image and, and you know, perception of, of what this means. So really, this is what we hear a lot of from Indigenous people is we're not welcome. We don't feel safe. We're going to stop here, not walk in because we just, we, how do we make it a safe space? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Also barriers, right? This is a huge barrier to entry. So in the words of Daenerys Targaryen, for those of you that know, we're going to break the wheel. I'm just kidding. We're not here to actually do that. But I love to reference these shows. Very powerful, very strong, uh, powerful female in the show as well. So we are going to talk about some of these barriers that we can that we can help with, that we can assist with, we can support. With. So, so one of them that we talked about, and I know Jamie mentioned systems. I love it because a lot of them are systems. So most of us are coaches, if not all of us, or have been or will be. Maybe we're administrators, whatever our personal background is. We can reflect on that a little bit. So that talked about colonialism and the effect on indigenous sport indigenous values or access to sport so if we don't feel safe we're not going to get involved we're going to go somewhere else and and, and like we talked about the, the suicide rates right the the the, the at-risk behavior the the isolation in a lot of our manitoba is very unique with our geography we have a lot of flying remote communities for those of you that could picture that um, just picture living, imagine living on an island where your store is on an island as well. So access to your, your basic needs of living. You have septic tanks, uh, boil water, advisories. So when we talk about sport for Indigenous people, again, we're all different. Everyone is different. We're not a, it's not a cookie cutter. We're not all the same. But things to consider. And that's some of the conversations you'll have uh, with that Aboriginal coaching module. So uh, structures, governance, policies, these are all things, boards, um, and even your own coaching values and coach philosophies or leadership philosophies, if it's not coaching specific. Think about that. How can we, how can we think we are human first? The highest levels, even that, that we've seen lately at the Olympics, champions, world champions, will come back and say, my, my mental health, my mental wellness is just... It's not good right now. I need to take a break. I need to step back. So if that's at the highest level we can imagine and think about what the, the, the recreational level um, of that, that wellness would be. So let's take a look at the, I think the next wheel is the next slide is the medicine hoop, medicine wheel. There we go. Perfect. Again, won't touch on this too much, but you can see how there's the four sections. If you're not familiar with the medicine wheel or the medicine hoop, you may have heard. So there's the four directions, the four medicines. The main thing we like to talk about is a holistic lens or a holistic approach to coaching. So if all we focus on is physical, that's one part of it. And the other three could suffer. May not, but probably will. Right? So how do we balance? How do we now involve the social emotional quadrant? How do we connect spiritually? All right. What does that look like? How do we, um, yeah, how, how do we get? Uh, the, the physical quadrant as well. How do we connect them? How do we get them working together? So again, I, I won't talk too much on that. That's probably a teaching all on its own or a, a night all on its own, but just uh, you don't have to use the medicine wheel. If you're not comfortable with it, that's fine. Again, like Jamie said, we're sharing this as a resource tonight. Connect with someone, connect with, uh, I'm sure we all know indigenous people that we can speak to about it. You can ask about it, connect with your PTASB, right? Take the ACM learn a little bit more, do some research, um, but just some things to consider. If uh, for, for practices, we have a lot of coaches that in their values and their philosophy is that, well, if you're late for practice, you're not, you're, you're running or you're not, you're not let in, you have to leave, whatever that looks like. So if we have this athlete that maybe we don't know their situation, maybe they're, they're just, they're not well, they're not themselves. They had a bad day. Maybe their, their home life or their living situation or their day at school their friends, socially, emotionally, that's hard. So they, they showed up. So I like to say, I'll use example of someone says, sorry, I'm late. I'm like, You're here. That is great. We love to have you. Then you can kind of have a discussion later. Again, feel free to take whatever you want. That's just kind of my personal approach, but that human first, right? Uh, maybe, 
maybe have some snacks available and they're just hungry and need a granola bar or an apple or something. Uh, maybe you have water because they don't have, again, access to water necessarily or some, some healthy drinks, something like that. So you don't have to isolate them, but uh, as, you're, as you get to know your, your athletes and your people that you're working with, whether it's, it doesn't have to be kids, it's not unique to kids either and youth, it could be adults, uh, older, older leaders as well. I'm not sure what ages we work with, but just some, some things to consider. So mental, emotional, spiritual, again, and that, that physical wellness. We're going to should be the calls to action next. Okay, so again, based on time, um, I'm just gonna, I'll kind of rush through this a little bit. The calls to action in sport is actually 91. There's a type error there, but that's okay. So 87 to 91. Sorry about that. Um, I'll, I'll read through them quickly. You can please use this resource and check on your own. Uh, it's actually located if you're in Winnipeg or in Manitoba. The office is at U of M, the Truth and Reconciliation Center. So call 87. So this one is about the government with uh, Indigenous peoples, right? Sports Hall of Fames, uh, other organizations, uh, educators, to, to tell the history. So... Uh, for an example, MASRC in Manitoba, we just recently published a book of excellence, the first of its kind. So it took about a year kind of during COVID to, to interview, to ask people about teams, builders, athletes, coaches, anyone through history that they felt deserves recognition. Because again, looking at Hall of Fames, looking at books, uh, awards, there wasn't a lot, unfortunately, even though the athletes are there, the coaches, the builders are there, the communities are there. So this is one made by Tom Longo to National Award for Indigenous, uh, I think it's male, female category. The, uh, we also have the Indigenous Sports Hall of Fame, so Manitoba Indigenous Sports Hall of Fame. So a couple of resources there. Okay, 88. Eighty-eight talks about government, the long-term athlete, original athlete development, which is just a different pathway. So we added to it a little more indigenous, uh, indigenous perspective, and the North American Indigenous Games. So lucky enough to have Jamie involved again as one of our coaches. I've coached uh, at two nags for uh, for basketball in fourteen and seventeen. Now I'm going. I'm attending as a staff uh, this this games. So really, this is like we're asking for support. And this is very unique. It's all of Turtle Island, which is North America. So there's going to be teams from the States. Uh, it's hosted in a different territory uh, every four years now. The next one will be in 2027. So how can we support our athletes and our teams and our coaches? That could be kind of a... Uh, actually, this will be another call to action. Yeah, 89. This one... Uh, we don't have to worry too much about this one. Let's go to 90. You can look up on these later if you want. This one is, is important for a little bit of the local, but a lot of, again, the government structures. So the Aboriginal coaching module, please look into it. Please reach out. Uh, here in Manitoba, MASRC, we actually offer this for free. And we try to host one a month if we can. And it's usually at the Sport Manitoba building. If you have a team, an organization, someone you have a group that wants to do it please reach out to us and let us know after nag preferably in about a month but we can go from there very very super valuable it's nccp certified so you'll get some pd points uh jamie's club agujin well jamie's club the club that jamie's involved with agujin and the mentorship program right so all indigenous clubs all indigenous programs some opportunities um get some coaches get people involved because we are there we are out there right you may not even know. So just some, a few opportunities. And then again, yeah, an anti-racism and sport campaign is out as well. Another kind of spoke in that wheel. And 91. The last one is much more international and national competition. So this is like the Olympics, the Pan Am Games, Commonwealth Games, right? Um, huge multi-sport, multinational games. Um, I think it's the, so 2026, Canada is co-hosting the FIFA World Cup. That'll be big. Basically what this is saying, not at maybe any of our levels, but governments are asked to 
if you're hosting something, speak with the Indigenous people, consult with the Indigenous people of that land, that territory, all right? Have them be a part of this. So that's kind of what this one is talking about. So those are the calls to action in sport. Again, please take more time to look into it. Um, they have these little, I like to keep this with me. It's a little toolkit uh, pocketbook. I just keep this with me. I keep it at my office. All right, a great resource, a great reference. So this could be a, a much longer conversation. Um, we also have a book that we published, MESRC, that's, uh, it basically translates to playing with a great heart. So traditional games, traditional indigenous games that was shared from some elders and some knowledge keepers and community members across the province. Um, and it's just about bringing back the fun. So I know Jamie talked a little bit about that before as well with the, the values. It doesn't have to be about winning right away. It's getting us involved, having us involved and whatever level that is great. So games are a great way to do that. Uh, introduce these movements. A lot of great athletes that don't even know sport necessarily, but you're bringing community together, you're bringing, uh, pe you're bringing people together, working on strengths, collaborating, a little bit of strategy. So I don't wanna talk too much. We wanna make sure we leave some time for questions. So uh, yeah, Marcy Miigwech, thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for having me and allowing me to, to speak today. Well, uh, I'm gonna give it back to Shay, unless there's anything else, we'll go to questions. Thank you, Jimmy and Kadane. Um, that was wonderful. Um, now we're going to open the floor up to questions. So uh, if you have a question, there's the option to do the reaction where you can raise your hand and we will be able to see that. Um, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask Jimmy or Kadane a question. I have Betty Ann has a question. Oh, sorry. And then we'll go to Nick right after Betty Ann. Um, can I, that little pocketbook that you've got, is that available through your PTSO? Yeah. We, I think we do have some of these in our office. Uh, I, I can't guarantee. I, th I thought we did, though, as a resource. So anybody in the Sport Manitoba building that wants to come to that office, um, we might have some. But we actually got these from the Truth Reconciliation Center. So they, okay. if we don't have some, reach out to them. They might have some as well. They just gave us a bunch for a, a presentation. But yeah, great resource. And can I, is that at the U of M, you said, Truth and Reconciliation? Yes. Yeah, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. I don't know the exact address, but it's on the, the U of M campus, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Nick. So uh, I guess the question is for Jamie. You had mentioned the difference between learning about and learning from, and that is a really, really uh, interesting and sort of thought provoking uh, assessment for me. So in my attempt to learn, how do I make sure that I don't cross that that fine line where like I'm just pestering somebody that really doesn't want to help or would not sorry I shouldn't say help but really doesn't want to talk about it or it might be uncomfortable and isn't in the position to teach like you would you had clarified yeah that's a good question so it's funny my partner and I were actually talking about this today and we were talking about it in reference to there are universities that will like bus med school students or social work students or whatever out to reserves and just bus them around the reserve and let them look and then they leave. So that is like the extreme example of learning about and not learning from <clears throat> treating indigenous folks like a museum or, a, <clears throat> you know, a, yeah, but um, the where we get into like the nuanced like less extreme examples it does get a little tricky um and i would say like go to the resources that have offered themselves for example kade and i have now offered ourselves to you and we are resources that you can access the manitoba aboriginal sport and rec or you're in new brunswick 
there's you know a, an indigenous sport body there um <clears throat> there are, i think that's a good place to start now i don't want to discourage anyone from having important and tricky conversations amongst their you know if you're non-indigenous and you want to talk about some of this stuff with other non-indigenous people i'm not discouraging that there are some tough things that need to happen um so that's not really what i was referring to but um yeah, I would say go to like kind of resources that are out there and making themselves available to begin with um, before you just kind of approach maybe your Indigenous athlete who's 14 because they're Indigenous. It doesn't mean that they want to be or are experts on like colonialism or, you know, decolonizing. So um, step one would be just kind of the experts that are out there or people that have offered themselves first. Um, and if you want to talk to that 14 year old athlete, build a relationship first and you know i think that that can come but i i just you know you want to make sure that the questions are consensual and the space is safe and and things like that so it, it's tricky i i acknowledge that but i think thanks for asking that question no thank you that that clarifies it <clears throat> i think i see ryan also has his hand raised uh shay yep go ahead ryan thank you uh, I'm from Treaty 4 territory here in southeastern Saskatchewan. Um, a few years ago, just at the beginning of the pandemic, I finished my 30-year teaching career in uh, public schools in Saskatchewan and, and then uh, moved into teaching at a First Nation school at Kakwishtau First Nation. And um, I, what I've, I think I've noticed, obviously, the pandemic was really hard on a lot of people with their lifestyles and maintaining health in a variety of different ways in their lives, not just physical, but emotional and social and mental. Um, but it, it seems maybe amplified in, uh, in some, some of the First Nations communities, like a lot of the kids and, and adults are having a harder time kind of reestablishing um, active lifestyles in a variety of ways. And uh, so in the school, like I'm, I don't have any experience really working with little kids. I don't have an experience working with Indigenous kids either. Um, my 30 years uh, were in schools where they were quite multicultural, but uh, just not many Indigenous kids. So I'm really out of my element, but, um, but I'm, I'm ch changing my focus in my school uh, to spend more time teaching phys ed to the younger kids, because I'm, I'm hoping maybe working with the younger kids, we can get more, uh, more physical activity and, and healthy living going. So I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions um, in a situation like that uh, in a First Nation community, like pretty, we got great facilities, uh, you know, supportive chief and council, all those kind of things. Um, it's just, um, yeah, it's just a struggle. Ted, I'm going to go ahead. You want to start us off? This is his job. <laughs> yeah, uh, that that is like you say a, a a very difficult question right now because that that's what we see every day in, in our visits. I think the fact that you're you've noticed that and you want to start engaging the the younger ones uh, that that's a start. So I don't know if there's if there's sports teams like organ organized sports there. If there's uh, if it's more recreational, if there's a certain sport they like, but we get a lot of requests for mostly right now. It's hockey is everywhere for sure, and basketball and volleyball. Those are kind of the the big big three for us. So it's okay to focus on that is, is what we like to say. Talk to the leaders. Talk to other uh, yeah maybe leadership or other people maybe in health that want to do something or they're already doing something, and and see see how you can support that. Because it doesn't have to be something new, completely out of the box. It can just be, hey, we want to play basketball or we want to play volleyball. Let's see how we can engage them more in that. Bring a friend, bring someone that they can connect with, build those relationships. Because if you say the facilities are there, um, yeah, just, just get them in there. Don't have a real good answer for that. Hopefully you can take something out of kind of the, the information I, I just talked about. And if Yeah, you I think what you said that, what you said about trying to integrate the other um, areas in the community, like the, the health people and the recreation people and stuff. That's another thing right. I've tried to, tried to push a little bit. Cause yeah, like the kids like sports, but mm -hmm. as, as far as our teams go, we have a hard time getting the kids to come out for the teams mm -hmm. and like to come to practice and to stick it out for the whole season. Um, you know, they, 
they'll, they'll play volleyball in, in the gym all day if you let them, but will they come out and be a part of a, an organized team that's practicing and going to tournaments and that kind of thing, which is a value in our community. Like our chief and council are very clear, like, Hey, sports is, is big. We want to do sports. Well, we want to do it right. Um, just trying to get the participation up. Yeah, if I could um, add to that a bit, and this I think applies to Indigenous kids and non-Indigenous kids, um, and this might not be a popular opinion, but um, we've all grown up with this mo model of sport that we know and are comfortable with, that is have a team, select a group, it stays rigid, you go to competitions, you practice technical abilities, you know, you go to provincials, whatever, there's this model that we know and understand. You start when you're little, you learn the technical stuff, you get into some tactical stuff, Maybe you'll go to college and play one day, whatever. But I think what's actually we're trying to stress here is like question, question that. Why does that matter? It doesn't really matter. Are you getting kids off the couch? Are you getting kids mobile? Are they having fun? Are they, you know, building habits and skills that will lead to like an active life? A lot of us in this space probably come from elite sport um and i also really value elite sport as well and competition but um those basics have to be in place movement just having fun feeling safe those basics have to be in place even for like olympians to succeed so i just feel like those basics are what we focus on and the rest can come the rest is details <clears throat> thank you both very much appreciate that uh, I see someone has raised their hand, but before that, there is a question in the chat, uh, Jimmy and Kanane, if you want to take a look at that. Um, any sport organizations or sport programs on our radar that we would consider models to follow or good examples of best practices? Um, well, there are many. Um, <clears throat> Kanane, you can butt in too. But, um, from my opinion, they're mostly like grassroots initiatives um, and not a lot of like formal sport bodies are doing what I think is best practices for Indigenous folks. But usually it's like grassroots stuff like, <clears throat> you know, there. So the examples that I would have in my mind, I can't like point you to because it's not like they have a website or <clears throat> a binder of how to do it. But um, maybe <clears throat> maybe this is something that we could follow up on. Keta and I could maybe put a list together of like folks across the country that kind of do programs that kind of follow what we're talking about. And maybe that can be part of a follow up email to this, the attendees of this, along with the recording of, of this Zoom. So I know that doesn't answer your question, Melanie, but I'm what I'm saying is they're out there. Um, but they're, you know, it's like kind of gra grassroots level still. So um, yeah. We'll just put some more thought into that. Okay, um, Sunny had their hand up first. Hi guys, um, I wanted to go to Jamie. Um, I wanted to go back to your great land acknowledgement uh, um, discussion there. <laughs> um, you stated uh, in terms of um, uh, commemorate Maybe can you provide an example how to commemorate? Um... Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I didn't really go too hard into that one, um, but I do think Indigenous Peoples History Month is inviting everyone to commemorate. So I provided some examples like we can commemorate people that have been harmed or who have sacrificed or who have struggled, but we can also commemorate the successes and the, you know, the baby steps that are being taken or um and so my where my mind goes is when i was working with the national inquiry um there was funding for specifically for commemoration for people to commemorate their loved ones or the violence they've experienced personally or whatever um but it was every individual that we spoke to and visited across um nations had a different idea of what that looked like for them. So commemoration could mean pushing the government to augment a statue or an art piece, but it also could just mean um, planting a flower or taking a certain walk and thinking or standing by the river, or it could mean um, <clears throat> writing an editorial or it could, you know, everyone has their strengths and everyone has things that 
um, mean something to them. So for me to commemorate, like I like to cook a nice meal and just like take my time with it and eat a nice meal and think about things. Or um, I like to talk to loved ones and friends about something that's like weighing on me or, you know, something I want to celebrate or talk about. So it kind of looks different to everyone. If you're talking more about like organized commemoration opportunities for that exist as well and funding exists for that as well. So if like, for example, Sunny, your nation wanted to commemorate a specific thing, um, I think it's a great idea to get like council or people together to do kind of a community thing. It kind of brings people together, but I know that's a vague answer, but I, in some, I think it's different, looks different for every person. Okay, awesome. Uh, next person is John. Hi, um, I was just going to um, wreck my uh, comment here to Ryan. Um, I'm currently, I've been involved in lacrosse for 42 years and it's an Indigenous game and you were saying that uh, you didn't know what sports to to sort of help with these kids. I go around the schools here in Manitoba where I live and uh, I teach the history of the game of lacrosse and I coach it and I coach at a high level. And I used to play at a high level as well, but I'm too old now. But I just thought that um, for me, lacrosse is, you know, it's been, <clears throat> there's a rich history there as well. It was colonized. It was taken away from First Nations people um, and we're sort of getting it back now. So, um, that, that would be a good starting point. That's just my suggestion is uh, that's a great uh, starting point for kids uh, learning the history and um, teaching them the game. And if you uh, ever need help, you can always reach out to us. Uh, I also work for Manitoba Lacrosse. Yeah, thanks, John. That's a great point. And then that reminded me, I want to point back to what Kade mentioned is the book that has been published about traditional games. They're very basic, very simple movements and activities that are entrenched in culture and like accessible to all bodies and, and, and ages. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Uh, I think Guy has his hand raised. Okay, it's in the chat from Guy. Um, he found multi-sport inclusive of all, keep it simple, find out what they're interested in, the adults as well, and do not minimize the sports offered. Um, any comments, Jamie Cadane, about that covered? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Even though there may be one or two popular main sports, a lot of the time it's the school sports because those are kind of the, the big ones that are through the school system and the ones that you see on TV. So when John mentions lacrosse, definitely 100% agree. It, and it is growing in popularity now too, which is great. And it's that connection with the story, uh, the origin. So not the colonized sport version that the, the settlers loved, liked, enjoyed, and stole. And then kind of, yeah, there's a whole story. I don't want to, I won't get into it completely, but the, the game, the sport that we know today was not the way it was played and not what it was intended for. So I love that John mentioned that and, and lacrosse is huge in indigenous community and it's coming back. So reclaiming that game as well as the, the, the culture and other traditions. So I, I love that. appreciate that, John. Lacrosse is, is awesome. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other Questions, comments, anything anyone would like to share before we conclude the session? Yeah, I'll maybe make one last comment. Um, <clears throat> so what Guy shared, I, I love that comment. I think that's a good step one in a way, um, but I just kind of want to stress again, like it's less maybe about like, as Guy is suggesting, the sport they're playing or the movement you're doing and more about like, decolonizing the attitudes and the assumptions and the norms in the space um, so that they're not there aren't harmful like underlay to the activities you're doing but um, but I do appreciate that you put thought into creating inclusive or broadening the activities available guy okay um, with that I think we will conclude tonight's session um, thank you everyone for registering and attending tonight. I hope you found this session valuable and have some takeaways from tonight. Um, for anyone who did not get to attend tonight, or if you would like to come back and revisit the session, um, the recording will be posted to Sport Manitoba's YouTube channel, hopefully within the next two weeks. 
Um, but yeah, thank you so much for attending and I hope you all have a wonderful evening.